Hi, today we're going to cover Unit 2 from the Art Talk book, The Elements of Art, and we're going to do Chapter 4, Line. To start off, we're going to do Lesson 1, The Elements of Line. The element of line, if you didn't know, lines are everywhere. You use them to write, you're looking at lines right now. And line is an element of art that is a path of moving points through space. What is a line? Artists use lines to lead your eye through a work of art. It is because it takes a movement to make a line. A line has a width and it has a length, but usually the width of the line is very small compared to the length. So think of maybe it's a millimeter wide and it could be an inch long or a couple of inches, it could be a foot. A line is thought of being a one dimension and that is mostly because of its length. And if you didn't know, dimension means it's the amount of space an object is to take up in one direction. So a 2D object, you would have your height, so that's how tall it is, and the width, which is how wide. So think of a painting of how tall and wide something is. If it's a 3D object, which means three-dimensional, it will have a height, width, and depth. So this would be a sculpture or even um, your water bottle that's sitting in front of you or the chair that you're on. So it has the height of how something, so how tall it is, the width of how wide, and the depth means how deep that that is going. So think of a cube in that also. A line that shows or creates the outer edge of a shape is called an outline. At implied lines, there are a series of points that the viewer's eye automatically connects. So an implied means that it's suggesting something rather than it's the real lines that would be connecting it all together. So you could think of dots or dashes, lines in a machine that has stitches in your clothing. It could be a trail of wet footprints. And down below are a few samples. So if we look at the one on the left, here we have just a few dashed lines. And what is that creating? A box. And if we look at the one on the right, it's not fully drawn out. These are all just implying. And what is it implying? A flower. Very good. The kinds of lines. We have five kinds of lines that you guys probably use when you're writing your name. So we would have vertical lines, horizontal, diagonal, curved, and zigzag. The first one is a vertical line. So this is something that goes straight up and down and they don't lean over to the side. Number two are the horizontal lines and they run parallel to the horizon. They don't slant. And if you didn't know, a horizon is that space that's in between the sky and the land. So think of a sunset that is on the horizon. So remember, horizontal lines go straight across and they don't slant. Number three, we have diagonal lines. And diagonal lines, they always slant. So they could be somewhere between mostly vertical or mostly horizontal. And they look as either if they're falling or rising, depending on how thick a line is, meaning how bold it's looking or how skinny it is, and the degree of which way it's leaning. Number four for the types, we have zigzag lines. And you guys would think of these as lightning bolts is what a lot of you would be drawing or action lines for electricity maybe. So zigzag lines, they're a combination of diagonal lines and they could change in their angle. They could be a very close together or they could be stretched out where there's a bigger space in between them. And number five, we have curved lines. So this is how they change direction and they could be gradual where it's more of a wavy or wiggly lines or they could be closer together where they would be forming spirals and circles. Now we're on to line variations. Lines appear in five major ways. So this is how the lines will look different. So we could have length of the lines, so they could be long or short. Two is the width of line, so it can be thick or thin. So think of, are you using, say, an ink pen, or are you using a bold tip marker to get your lines to have them thick or thin? Texture, they can be rough or smooth. So this would be like, are we using a nice gliding ink pen on our piece of paper, or are we using 
chalk would create a rougher line. For the directional lines, they can move in any directions. They could be vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. And then we have five, the degree of the curves. So lines could be a gradual, where they're just slightly wavy, or they could be getting tighter and tighter to where they would form spirals. So that would be the degree of curve that we would have on our lines. So these five variations can be combined in many ways. You can make them long, wide lines. They could be rough or short or they could be smooth and curved. The media tools in the surface used to make the lines affect the way a line looks. So media would be, are we using paint, pencil, chalk? Tools would be, is it a marker? Is it a pencil? Are you carving on something? The surface used to make the lines affect the way it looks. So paper has different texture to it too. So it could be like computer paper where it's really smooth or we could have sketchbook paper to where it has a deep texture for the thicker parts, or if it's a watercolor paper, it would have a different texture. Also, canvases have different texture, and if we were to be drawing on, say, wood or something, that would maybe have a texture depending on if it's hardwood or softwood. Some other things could be concrete, maybe, uh, for, say, sidewalk, chart, chalk, art, it has a rough texture on it. If we were painting, you know, on the side of a barn, that would be, you know, the texture of the wood and everything. So it depends on the media, tools, and surface that would make lines look different. Lines and value. So value, if you didn't know, is an element of art also, and it describes how dark could be or how light an object could be. So it's the darkness and lightness of an object. Values depend on how much light a surface reflects. A surface that has a dark value, if it re it's going to reflect little light. If it's a light value object, it's going to reflect a lot of light. So if something is a dark value, say, something that's a black object is going to reflect very little light whereas if it's a white object it's going to reflect more light so an example is when you make a pencil mark on a piece of white paper you're creating a line with a certain value the harder you press the darker the value would be that would also be for if you're using say crayons or colored pencils So when we're using lines and value together, there's a thing called cross-hatching. And what cross-hatching is, it's a series of lines that are closely placed together to create darker areas. So they could run parallel or they could cross each other. So cross-hatching is what this technique is called. And as you can see on the value scale below, on the left, that's where a whole bunch of lines have crossed over each other repeatedly. And they're super close together. And as we go towards the right of the value scale, it's getting lighter and lighter. And as you can see on that, that's because they are putting less lines on each other. The value that the group lines create depends on four factors. First is the number of lines, the size of space between the lines, the media used, and the tools. So once again, the number of lines would be how many lines it has, the size, and the space between the lines. So like on the right side of the value scale, we have a lot more of a space than what we would do on the left side. Also the media. So are we using a five point pencil lead or a seven or a nine? And that goes along with ink pens. It could be an ink pen or it could be a marker. That would create different types of media and this, what size the lines are. Here are some samples of artwork that uses cross-hatching. So the artist Albrecht Durer is the one that has done this and it's just showing some pillows with a whole bunch of cross-hatching. And then down below is another one that's a still life of different types of vessels, and it has a whole bunch of different cross-hatching. If we think of even decades 
ago, when people were printing magazines and newspapers, if they needed a picture done, the artist was carving lines onto a metal plate and then they would rub ink on it and then run it through this press with paper on top. And this is how they were getting artwork back then. Lesson two, the expressive qualities of line. Here we have different types of directions and lines can express different ideas and feelings. This is why line is a very important element of art and it's used in a good part of them. So example, vertical lines can make certain objects look taller. So if you're wearing a shirt that has vertical lines, then you may look taller. Whereas if you have horizontal lines on your short shirt, it will make you look a little bit shorter. Vertical lines are creative, or sorry, are static and inactive, and they appear to be at rest. Expressive stability, artists use them to show stiffness, formality in an artwork. If they're using horizontal lines, they're also static, just not as much as a vertical line, and they express the feeling of rest and peace. Think of just laying down, that one when you would be resting. Stability would also be another one. So this one, if you see a lot of lines in some type of artwork, you're going to feel more content and relaxed and calm than if you had vertical lines. Curved lines, they change different directions, so that is going to express activity. So how much an activity they express depends on the type of curve of something. So if it's a less of a curve, it's going to feel a little bit calmer. Whereas if we have really tight spirals going around and around, that's going to create that hypnotic feeling. So if you're staring at it, it's going to look like it's going to keep moving on you. Diagonal lines, they express instability, tension, activity, and excitement also. They appear to be either falling or rising, depending on which degree that they are. And it could also be the tilt of which way the diagonal lines are. So this could be making you feel uncomfortable when you're looking at it. It could add tension to the artwork, or it could even create some type of excitement in this artwork that you would be looking at. Zigzag lines often create confusion because you're not for sure which direction that you would want to be looking. So this is showing something very active. So think of a lightning storm would one that would be showing activity. Actions, say, especially in comic books, maybe you see those. So you're going to feel excitement and nervousness. And it's going to depend on which direction the zigzag is going. If it's moving horizontal, one example would be a picket fence, where that's just a very straight line with slight zigzags. But an irregular zigzag, which means it's going all different directions, would be a streak of lightning. And then we have contour lines. This is one a lot of you probably haven't heard of before. But what a contour line is, is the edges of a surface ridge of an object. So it's creating the boundaries and separating one area from another. So to think of this is coloring books. You guys have seen those before. Those are all made out of contour drawings. And the now really popular things called adult coloring books where they have a lot of the details, those would be more detailed contour line drawings. And later we will be learning how to do contour line drawings for this unit. So when we're doing the contour line drawings, you're gonna add observation to something instead of just looking at, at something printed off we're going to start looking at or observing say our hands and looking at the placement of where our lines are and how to draw those lines or a still life which is something that we would set in front of us that would not be living so you guys are used to seeing you know, like bowls of fruit and that type of stuff so that is something where we're going to look at the contours and more details of those objects when we're drawing the contours, you're going to let your eye follow the object's outside edge. And at that same time, you're going to not lift up your pencil when it's drawing on the piece of paper. 
And at first, this is tricky to do just because you're always used to looking at your piece of paper, picking it up, and erasing. This is a study skill. So as our eye is looking at the top of something and moving downwards, our pencil would be at the top of the page and then we would be moving downwards. And then if our eye follows to say the bottom going right, then our pencil would be going to the bottom and right. And when we get into drawing the contour drawings, I'll have some demos that I'll show of you how to do this. And here's a very simplified contour drawings that some artists have done. So you can see that's detailed to where you still understand what it is. Gesture drawing is something that a lot of us are not used to doing. So this is when we're drawing something really fast or putting the gesture into it, also known as something expressive in movements. So a purpose of why you would be doing gesture drawing is especially when you would be drawing, say, your pet or people, drawing football players that are actually playing. The purpose of this is to draw in the gesture really fast so you're creating that motion of what you were actually seeing. And this, you don't put a lot of details. A lot of artists do a gesture drawing out in the open, say at the park, and then they bring it back to their studio and then would add more details to it. So even setting outside, we could just be watching the vehicles go by and we could sketch them or people walking by and sketch them really fast with some details, but we would take it back and then make a more elaborate drawing that way. So gesture drawing is an expressive movement to where we're drawing things, a rough sketch with more details later in another study to come with. So famous artists, especially in the Impressionist movement, did this because they were always doing things outside and then they would bring something back to their studio and then do an elaborate painting of that. And calligraphy, I'm sure you guys have heard of that. That is done with brushes or a lot of us use ink pens or calligraphy pens anymore, but calligraphy means beautiful handwriting. It's also associated with Asian writing and art. That is where it first came from. So Chinese and Japanese use the same types of calligraphy lines. So different curves and the skinniness of how things are. So they're using the same type of lines and brush strokes in forming characters for their own language and their paintings. So they're making the same type of calligraphy lines. It's just spelling something else out. And then their strokes, like if you have ever used the pins before, they go from thin to thick, depending on which way that you're holding your brush or your pen. And here's a sample of at the top, you can see that it's their language and then down below is an actual painting that they did just with ink and a little bit of color but it's with a brush that was dipped into the ink so it's calligraphy meaning beautiful handwriting and if you find this type of artwork interesting the nelson atkins museum down in kansas city actually has a whole section that is just full of this. It's the Far Eastern art part of the museum. And that's all I have. Thank you.